Hello, everyone, and welcome to MSP Geek Future Now. Today, I'm joined by none other than the best person in the entire world, Wes Spencer. Wes, how are you doing? Shax. Shax. Uh, man, I'm doing good, Kyle. How are you? Uh, I, I, you know, I'm doing. It's been really busy March. Um, yep. Seems like everyone wants to shove six years worth of time into March. What is it about Marches that are know. always like that? I don't know. You know, it's like it's like January is always chill, right? Because like they don't really want to be bothered with anything, and then February is like you know maybe we should get started on that project, and then March is when they it's like it's when Why it all it just goes yet? boom. It's not done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So man, there's a whole bunch of folks in chat. They're saying uh, the audio is odd. Uh, so this is going to be fun. I'm going to listen to it, and we're going to have so some man, feedback. there's a whole bunch of folks oh, in chat. Wonderful. The audio is odd. Uh, am I quiet? Is that what it is? You sound good on my end. I always sound good to you. I think it's because I think I sound quiet. Let me. Uh... I'm gonna make some changes. Fill in, Wes. Yo yo. All right, I can fill in. So how about that Octobreach, man? Uh, this is some wild stuff that's uh, all starting to unpack here. Um, I was talking to one of my friends, um, Drew Perry. He's the CISO at Valvoline, and uh, he had a really good post on LinkedIn uh, about it, right? Like the timing, I'm, I think it'll be very interesting. And I'm, I'm, a day, I'm a day stale. I've been away from complete news blackout just from the course of the day. So I don't even know what's happened in the past like 12 hours with that thing, but uh, man, the timing of when it happened and then their silence um, and sort of like the everything is okay uh, is, man, that's just, I think this is going to get to be a wild story. I think there's a lot we still don't know about this one. Yeah, it's it's insane. Like it's, when I, I woke up and the first thing I saw was Okta's been breached and I'm like, oh God, no. Um, and it, while it's not like an official breach, it does appear that they were breached. Um, they've kind of, they kind of went like, uh, like tried to play it off. Like it was no big deal. Like someone got compromised somewhere, but they fixed it before anything happened. And then those screenshots looked pretty, uh, detailed, <laughs> like pretty involved in somewhere. Yeah. And then suddenly it makes sense. Cause lapsus isn't exactly known as like a, an elite, uh, threat actor group by any stretch. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, man, you see, you see, like, you, I think a lot of people were wondering the correlation of how they were able to get so many access in so many places. And if this turns out to be the mechanism, it's yet another um, huge, 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 I don't know if we want to call it a supply chain attack or what yet, but um, pretty significant. Yeah. Maybe it's this new category um, because it, it's, it's in the supply chain, but it's not like a normal supply chain attack. Like it's in the application chain, maybe. Yeah, um, but it's it was not a good day because mm -mm. immediately you know, everyone's like, do you use Okta? Do you use Okta? Who uses Okta? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's that's a funny like we've seen this happening. I've seen this happen in the enterprise space for for years before, and it's now crept in the MSP space of the second some notable event happens of some kind, everybody, do you have this? You know, it, everyone's asking who's got it because we don't know. And we don't even know from our vendors who has what. And a lot of times our vendors don't even know what's going on, right? Like, especially vendors where like a bunch of stuff is done overseas and, you know, you just don't know, they don't even themselves deeply know it's in the stack. It's it's a problem that needs to get solved. Uh, and, and I think open standards are the only way that we're going to be able to drive, drive innovation in that area. Uh, but it's a major problem. Yeah. It's, uh, it's worrisome for sure. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't even know. Cause you can have, uh, what is it? A software bill of materials type deal. Mm -hmm. Um, but even then you're not going to be able to get as deep, like there's, like one note, like you default install react and you get a thousand libraries. Like you can't, right. That's you can't navigate through all of that. That's, that's impossible. Yeah. So uh funny story about that. Um, this, I can share this now. I don't think there's any like NDAs that would stop me from sharing this that I'm aware of. 
um, <laughs> famous last words. Now I'm thinking about it. <laughs> right. Uh, but in the old days of perch, this is like 2017 mm, is what I think something like that. We were really good friends with, um, the CISO of an organization that I will not name, but a fortune, probably a fortune 100. So really large. And he's like, Hey, I don't really have use for perch because you know, we've got all this stuff built in house. Cause we're a mega empire of a company. He's like, but I have a problem that I need solved. And uh, it was all around this vendor stuff. And he's like, man, he's like, do you know, I have two FTEs in my security organization. Literally their jobs are to, to send out Excel um, like spreadsheets to our vendors, our third-party vendors. He said, we have over 5,000 of them and understand what they're using, what kind of software is in place, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then all they do is correlation. So when like the next CVE comes out, we go jump on it and then use our SLAs with those vendors. And they literally are just box checking of like, do you have XYZ in place? And this was all like way back in the day when I'm trying to remember what the vulnerable, oh, it was the Heartbleed. It was all the SSL versions of vulnerabilities yeah. that are coming out, Heartbleed and, and all of those. And that's what kicked that off for them. He's like, so he's devoting... I don't know, quarter million dollars a year, probably more when you consider like um, benefits and all that into the meatware costs of literally just box checking this stuff. And he's like, can you guys like, are you, can you help me with it? And we actually built like a early beta product that didn't really go anywhere um, that would like you go into this vendor platform and you would go and select the things that you have in place. I use Microsoft, I use whatever. The problem is that was the big problem. Like what, what exactly you can't just hit Microsoft and Microsoft makes a bajillion things. Like you said, this instant you select, I don't know, I'm just going to pick something, right? Like uh, solar winds, since that was a big thing a couple of years ago. Uh, what all is embedded in that? We don't know, right? But the whole goal of it was, it was going to go and query CVE and or, um, uh, NIST uh, CVE database. And when something new came out, it would automatically notify to any of the vendors that had subscribed it, I'm using this software. And I thought it was a great idea in theory, but like, there's still way too many inputs that are missing to make something like that work. Um, because like you said, we don't even know so many of the libraries that go into things. So it just, exactly. it's, it's still yeah. a problem. Um, so before I ask my leading question into the next topic, into the topic we're going to discuss, uh, which is catching up with you. Uh, it, Wes's internet appears to be currently unstable. <laughs> so Did say that again, uh, your internet is currently unstable. Um, yeah. It, it might go problems. out. We hope not. Um, we'll, if it happens, it happens. Uh, and I'll, I'll fill in the dead air, but just in case, just so no one's surprised when you're replaced with a picture of the space. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, on that note, um, so why don't you tell us a little bit? So I know who you are. A lot of people know who you are, but let's, let's can you give me like a quick synopsis. You know, you already mentioned Perch, which everyone which I'm super familiar with and love as a product. Uh, so can you give us a quick synopsis of what you do and what your past experiences yeah. are? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I, you know, my, I've always been technical in my background. Um, I kind of hide that these days. I was talking to Slagle one time about this and he said, he's like, you're a little bit more technical than I thought you were. I'm like, yeah, I like to kind of hide a lot of that, but I've gotten, you know, I'm not nearly in the weeds as I used to be. And I, I do miss that, but I started out at a college, like as a Linux admin in a, in a shop that was like a hundred percent open source stuff and all doing B2B stuff. And it was cool, but um, really wanted to do something different and had an opportunity to go over as like a network admin at a university at Murray state, um, go racers. They were just in the tournament and got beat by that St. Pete Saint or something. Saint Mary? Yeah. St. Yeah. Peter's. Saint, no, it's like St. Peter's or something. It's up in yeah. New Jersey. I had a few New Jersey friends, uh, laughing at me. Anyway, it's all sports ball to me. So whatever. Um, and, uh, it, it, um, I enjoyed that. I actually, here's what it was a pivotal moment in my career is there was a guy that was teaching, um, like a network security class, like IP tables, snort, uh, squid proxy, like a bunch of that stuff. Like this is 2010, probably something like that. And he would have been threatening to leave forever. Like, I'm going to retire. I'm going to retire. And, he, and everyone called his bluff. And so finally, one time he retired and he just didn't show up. And he's like, I told you guys I was going to retire. And they're like, what? You know, he's like, I've been telling you for years. You wouldn't listen. So he did. He just retired. And they're in a panic. And they're like, hey, like, Wes, do you think you can teach this class? And I'm like, I don't even have a master's degree. No, I can't teach this class. Like, I understand firewalls really well. And I can learn snort, you know, good enough. But like, no. 
And they're like, no, we have nobody to teach this class. We have like 30 kids enrolled. Like we have, no, and you don't just go find somebody that can teach like network security. Right. Exactly. And so uh, it was a wild thing, but I was fine. Like, I was like, I don't, I just don't think so. And like, how about we pay you 2000 bucks? And it's like a super poor, like network yeah, admin yeah. for a small state run. You're like, I'll like, do something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, bingo, let's do it, baby. Should have, you should have led with that. Not right. a lot of things back then I wouldn't have done for 2000 bucks. Yeah, amen to that. Right? I've been there. Uh, so, so I did it and um, I, I actually loved it. I fell in love with it. And I took the humble route of like I, first words, to the class were like, Hey, uh, I just graduated like two years ago. Some of you, I was in classes with, so I'm like, I'm not going to pretend to have any answers here. We're just going to go through this together. And there's going to be a whole bunch of, I don't knows if you ask me a question and we're just going to figure it out ourselves. I mean, isn't that the whole point of it anyway? Like we learn things as we go and it went great and I loved it. And there, there was a lot of times I had, I don't knows. Um, but fast forward, um, I ended up getting a master's degree and taught for many, many years um, in a like, and I loved it. it. I lab time. It's actually where I learned crypto. I started doing crypto mining um, way back in like 2012, something like that. But I just got burnt out. I got to this point in my career where like I hit a wall and I was like, I got to do more with life. There's got to be more to like, I'm just tired of teaching classes. And so as luck would have it, this um, there was an opening that came up for a, for a banking job for a CIO at a bank, and I happened to know somebody who knew the CFO, which is the only reason they would they would even interview like a an academic, right? And uh, so we met and we talked, and like this was like a match made in heaven. And so I went over. The bank was called F and B, and I spent um, three and a half years there at F and B um, as the CIO. And man, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about like regulations and how banks kind of operate and like enterprise security. I learned so many things that were really valuable for me and leading a team, all this stuff. And I got real involved in threat Intel and like threat Intel sharing. And that's actually how I met Aaron Chernin, who's the CEO of, uh, or was the founder CEO of Perch. Of course, um, it's connect, it's under ConnectWise umbrella now, but um, and so that was a ton of fun, um, kind of doing a bunch of work in like the Intel sharing sector and working along DHS. And I got nominated some some advisory boards there. And then um, we actually um, saw that there was this huge gap in the market of like down market. No one was doing anything with Threat Intel at all. And Perch's earliest platform was not a SIM. It was a product that we believed would just ingest intelligence and then detect it on the wire. And that was it. And we we're like, no one's doing this outside of fortune 500, we could really make this thing blow up. And so we went and left our jobs um, and created a company called Perch and had basically no money to do it. And we were trying to pitch and get invest in, investments and no one would talk to us because we were a bunch of nobodies, no street cred. And it's amazing to think of like what Perch became versus what it was in the early days is like wild to me because we made so many big pivots that were necessary to survive in the channel. Uh, but we, when we started, I didn't even know what an MSP was really, uh, let alone, I don't think they even knew what security was for the most part back we, in 2016, 17. <laughs> Let's be honest, we still don't. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of the history, right? And uh, um, in 10 more seconds, I'll just say, so I spent a year at ConnectWise as their VP and external CISO. And my job was just to like work with our partners, um, just like you on cybersecurity, messaging it, all that great stuff. And then um, recently left ConnectWise just a few weeks ago and I'm currently kind of doing a little bit of nothing right now. I'm doing a lot of advising companies and I'm taking a, a bit of a cool my jets off a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah. And then re um, re some big things are coming on board soon. Well, that's good. Um, and I know that, uh, I know you're involved in a lot of things, right? It's you're, You can't not be at... You know, it, with with your connections and your people and your friendship circles, you can't not do things. You can't not sit still. It's not something you can it's, do. It's fun, you know. Um, and I'm a lazy person by nature, so if I don't get involved, I'm just going to go video game and my life disappears. And I can't do that. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah I have to stay busy. You um, know, like some people, like my neighbor, if you give him free time, he's like fixing something in his house and like mm -hmm. cool stuff. And I'm like, I wish I could do that, but I can't. I don't. So yeah, right. It, you you look and think that your free time is they're using their free time you know, nice and wisely. And you're sitting here on a podcast with some guys talking about it stuff and security. Yeah. And, this is my happy place. Right. It's, it's, this is, this is mine too. I enjoy, uh, it's teaching, you know, going back to teaching. That's what I enjoy doing. Um, I'm not always great at it. Um, but I, I try to spend my time, uh, educating others and, and bringing content to people and, just making the overall atmosphere better. I mean, that's why MSP Geek exists, right? That's why it's gone as far as it is, because of things like this, like the future now, so where we're discussing the new. Um, 
So it's 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 you know we have like-minded individuals throughout the community who who do this, and it's great. Um, so you mentioned crypto. Uh, so I've Ed. I've done crypto. I've mined uh, Ethereum. I've mined uh, the original Ethereum Classic, ETH Classic. I've done that. Uh, I've got cards. I've done the flashing of the four eighties and five eighties and all that great stuff. Uh, it's it's a it's an interesting concept in general, um, with with how, how with how it's set up. Um, as someone who's more influenced in that area than I am, uh, and has more knowledge in that area, and who has made his own coin, which I have not done, uh, dictator coin, go buy it. Uh, yeah, it's a total scam. So you should definitely go buy it. Like, <laughs> flip it. Give me some money. Um, <laughs> what? Crypto's got a whole ton of different. I mean, there's NFTs are powered by crypto. Uh, applications are powered by crypto. Money is powered by crypto. What do you think? Do you think that crypto and blockchain in general has its place in the MSP world for things? Do you think uh, that's a possibility? I, that's a cool question. I don't think anybody has ever asked that question. Like, you're probably the first human on earth that has ever asked that question of like, seriously, of like, does the channel and crypto go together? Well, I think eventually, but we've got years to go. Um, I always like in when I look at like areas of technology, I like to liken them into like um, other other eras so we can make a, like a connection. And if you consider like the internet itself was, you know, it came out of DARPAnet and like, what was it? The seventies ish, something like that. And then you fast forward to today when other than my internet, that doesn't seem to want to behave today. It's sort of ubiquitous. Like you don't even think that you're on the internet. Like my watch is all the time telling me stuff. And I never think, oh, this was some kind of TCP that happened uh, with some packets that were transmitted between this device and whatever else over Bluetooth that went over from there to a wireless router and then, you know, did what it did in uh, its BGP routes to get out to the internet, blah, blah. We just don't think about that. It's like in the background of our minds, right? It's embedded into just an assumption that it exists. And I think if you take crypto as a space, um, and I really should say blockchain, we're like in the 1980s, you know, maybe, maybe late 80s, maybe. Um, think about like the eighties and nineties, you could, you get on the internet for sure, but it was like very laborious. There weren't a lot of use cases for it. Um, it would be fair for anyone back then saying like, you know, what the heck is the internet for? You know, like it has no use case for, you know, it really doesn't, but the futurists, it's always the futurists. They're like, yes, but a day is coming when you will have like a Dick Tracy style. You probably don't even know who Dick Tracy is. I know you, who Kyle? Dick Tracy is. You do. Oh yeah. man. Let's see in chat. How many of you guys know Dick Tracy? I'm watching chat. We'll see how many of them actually do. Uh, but yeah, you know, and, and here we are today with this stuff, right? So it takes a long time for us to get there. And so with crypto, if you think about it, are there use cases? Um, yes, but nothing yet that like we're seeing that are like driving something so significant outside of maybe a few places. Like, um, and I realized you asked me about the channel, but I want to elaborate just a little bit yeah. so we can get into like what it would be in the channel. So like take gaming, for example, gaming is really pushing the envelope here. Um, there's a company called Dapper Labs. Dapper makes this thing called NBA Top Shots, which is more shooty hoops, sports ball stuff. Um, but it's like it, for me as a kid, I remember going to the drugstore and buying a pack of baseball cards. Today's kids don't do that, right? They get the DAP, they have the Dapper Labs app on their iPad or whatever it is, and they download and purchase the newest pack or whatever, and it gives you access to all these new like like virtual sports cards, which are NFTs. And they're traded actively. It's a multi-billion dollar industry, just NBA top shots. And it's all done by blockchain, 100%. But no kid even knows it. And that's one of the very few examples that I can think of that's like completely blockchain driven, but yet the blockchain is transparent in the background. So many other areas of like blockchain tech are not transparent in the background. They, they're, they're way, 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 way too much interaction with all of it. And so... Um, think about it this way. Here's a kind of a cool way. I think Kyle um, is like, I think if you look at what blockchain can do, let's take a, let's think about it for a minute. Like it's encryption, right? Encryption drives everything. It's public key encryption, right? So I have this ability to say, I have a private key and a public key. I can share that public key with anybody in the world safely. They can use that public key to send me a secure message. I can use my private key to encrypt something and send it out and prove it was authentic by me. 
okay, so that's, we've been doing encryption since the PGP days pretty commonly. That exists, but what didn't exist was a decentralized architecture for all of that to land and stay forever. That's censorship proof because it can be there forever. And it is pretty much impossible to take down unless you take down the internet. That's what blockchain really developed for us. So like, where could that kind of technology go in the channel is a big question. What could we do with those kinds of things? I think maybe with like off, like <laughs> you look at what happened with um, uh, um, the, the whole hack, the Okta hack that we saw this week, right? Could there be innovation in that area? A hundred percent there could be. Um, but outside of that, I'm still tr struggling to kind of see where, and may, I'm curious what you think, Kyle, where some of that innovation on blockchain could hit inside the channel. My first thought is communication. Um, password resets, uh, Active Directory user account creations and removals. I mean, if you can authenticate that came from the one source and one person, <clears throat> that eliminates having to call their supervisor or have them hang up and call them back on their number that we have that they don't give us, right? Um, things like that that allow us to be more secure. Email messaging um, could be used for that. Um, it. Uh, that's my initial like thoughts that pops into my head uh, for for use in as far as the blockchain goes. Um, but I I I feel like the blockchain itself is in a almost a beta state. Like we haven't really unlocked the power of a blockchain and what it could do and how it can operate. Um. So the it's going to take someone much smarter than me. <laughs> To be able to to unlock what I I think is the future of the blockchain, um, but its current state isn't the future, you know, right? Uh, I mean, there's Ethereum's a brand new coin that or a chain that that minted itself. Um, Bitcoin, of course, is one you know, of the old school ones. A lot of the 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 upstart blockchains are based off Ethereum, which is cool, but not a lot of them like it, you know the, the application is mainly meant to, to to buy and sell goods um to, or to play the stock market in a nerd way <laughs> uh so there's i haven't seen a whole lot of use case applications aside from nfts which not going to get into nfts uh but you know the the use case for for blockchain technology isn't necessarily used a lot right i mean people are saying you know use my coin but you can have an app right this is my app and you can do charges and stuff to it and that's that's us but you have our coin that you can transfer but i think it goes beyond monetary value um it it does and um i think you're exactly right like we still have to see the tech mature um I, that's exactly where we're at right now. Uh, you even look at like, take Ethereum that you mentioned a minute ago, right? Ethereum was so incredibly innovative when it first came out in like 20, whatever it was. I can't even, I can't even remember the year 13? anymore. But it's, yeah, since, uh, we have to be after 13. I'm, I'm going to guess 2016 is just what I would guess, but let's go, let me Google it real quick and let's see, just because I'm, I'm going to guess 2015 because I, I remember was. getting into it around 2015, 2016. Yeah, uh, you nailed was... it. 2015. Yep. So I knew it was somewhere in that little era. And, and when it came out, it was like this like amazing thing because it had one innovation to it, which was you can write code and Ethereum virtual machines can then run that. And this was like this brand new innovation that Bitcoin had never done. And I can't say had never dreamed it, but what Vitalik did with Ethereum was so innovative in that, in that time period. So like use case for this, you and I could say, hey, we're going to bet that, you know, XYZ team is going to win tomorrow in the NCAA tournament. And we both put one Ethereum or a quarter Ethereum, whatever in, and we write some code that basically goes and checks via API the score, which everyone has the higher number, then the code then sends the full amount from both of us to either you or me based on who wins. And you can't stop it. And I can't stop it. It's the coolest thing. But then as soon as it started to like come to life, all of a sudden it fell apart because of transaction fees because it was so limited in its capability and speed. And now you look at where Ethereum is at today, and I just saw some new updates that um, Vitalik has released, and I guess the whole team has released it, or some cool stuff. But like, you have all these new innovative blockchains like Solana and in the Cosmos ecosystem, and all these others that are like way, way, way innovating on top of all that. So you're right, like we're still in this age of like, it's too slow. 
and it can't do enough. Like it doesn't have the functionality to do a bunch of things. And there's a whole bunch of like security problems on top of all of this. And so it's, it's amazing. I totally agree with you that like, while the tech seems so amazing, it's also like at its infancy, uh, it has a really long way to go. Yeah. I mean, even just like Bitcoin, like I think Ethereum made Bitcoin what it is today. Um, without Ethereum popping out, I don't think we'd have had the, the craze that we did in 2015. Um, it's, it's just an interesting, you know, thought exercise to go back and just look at where it was to where it's at today. Um, cause I, I made money on Bitcoin and Ethereum. I just, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I played that market. Uh, I didn't win as much as I could have, but I, I won hundred <laughs> percent. What matters. Right. Uh, I didn't lose money. I, I think I still have the cards that I used to mine with too. Um, but those, it's, those days are fun mining, man. I miss those days. I, I don't it because I, as soon as I got everything set up and working, it crash, and then it, I'd have to go back in and be like, "All right, why aren't you mining at what you're supposed to be mining?" And like your receipt it's stuff. A, and, yeah, it's a lot of sysadmin work. I was talking to an MSP actually at IT Nation Connect um, a few months ago, and he's getting into Bitcoin mining, and he's getting into like those big. You ship in the entire trailer truckload things, and like of like the huge miners. And I told him like, Hey man, power to you, but I've been down this road. I, I think you're grossly underestimating how much admin work this stuff is because the instant it goes down, you're losing tons and tons and tons of money. Um, you, you just, you can tolerate zero downtime with these things. It's, it's a lot of work. And then the power consumption requirements on top. It's insane. It it's is insane. Like I, I, the, when I was doing it, I was, I was con contemplating moving to like Northern Canada <laughs> just to have to get just the cooling requirements as well. You know, you have to, it, that stuff gets hot and you know, it's just, you know, just put stuff outside and just let it run cause it's cold and, you know, self warming. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, so, it's go ahead. I was to say someone in chat said they made 300 bucks on ape in 24 hours. <laughs> I don't, uh, I, I also made about 600 bucks on ape the second it came out on Voyager. And then I sold it within like three hours. No, I mean, it was closer to a day, I think. And I made some good money on it too. <laughs> it's fun. Those, those cryptos are fun for sure. Uh, hey, I thought of Kyle, mm. a cool use case. Uh oh, I want to, I want to pitch this to you. I want to see what you think. All right. I'll put them on so, investor uh, hat. Credit, credit where credit is due. This idea came from a guy named Balaji Servician, is I think how you say his last name. Balaji is awesome. Uh, he. Uh oh. Wes's internet froze. He's being DDoSed. Well, I mean. <laughs> uh, it's a. Censored. <laughs> there you go. He's, he's been censored. Uh, it was, it's, you know, it's, it's crypto, you know, that's, it is what it is. And he was going to give up the secrets. Uh, uh, Lando Calrissian. Um, I was so enthralled with waiting to hear this, this idea. I don't even know what to do anymore. Oh, these, uh, I, oh, it's me. I'm here. fantastic it's it, it's double me congratulations guys um uh so msp geek does not have an nft uh and if we make an nft i will 100 percent tell you it's a scam not to buy anything but give me all give the company all of your money uh kyle how are you doing over there I'll, you know i could interview myself it's great uh i'm good how are you i'm fantastic it's lovely to be here today um the ISP fault tolerance exactly. He 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 has a hotspot he could hook up to. So we'll see if his internet comes back in a timely manner before he decides to do that. Uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> I'm just surprised my camera's working over there. Uh, mainly because it wasn't working earlier and now it is. It's self love with Kyle. Uh, I'm starting a blog. I'll eventually have it up. Kyle Spencer. That's me. Uh, I'm now Wes. Um, Ooh, I got, oh, here we go. Uh, since I have to do all of these things anyway, um, like subscribe, uh, give me your money. If you have Amazon prime, you can give the, ch the, the, the channel your money. Um, Amazon prime is free. Um, 
if you just connect your Twitch account with your Amazon Prime account, you get a free sub and you can sub to the channel, which gives us money. Thanks, Jeff Bezos. Uh, uh, go buy our merch in the merch store. Dumpster Fire t-shirt. Um, what are things you shouldn't say or do in public? There's a lot of things. Um, I think it's more appropriate to what you should say and do in public. would probably be easier to answer. Um, but you should definitely purchase the Dumpster Fire t-shirt. It's a fantastic t-shirt. It's, it's a little bit, it's a, it's a literal dumpster fire. Uh, if your Prime sub's not available, you can still give me five bucks. Uh, I'm just saying. <laughs> I don't know why. The best dance move I know is the Cabbage Patch, circa 1990. Um, oh, is he back? He's back. <laughs> I, I'm going to figure this out tonight. I don't know what the deal is. Uh, my, my Wi-Fi router, uh, just keeps resetting. So you were like, it was, it was, it could not have been set up if you tried, you were like, this is how to do everything correctly. And then you just went offline. You just froze, and it was great. Uh, I don't even remember what I last said. Oh, I remember. I was going to pitch to you an idea mm -hmm. uh, where blockchain could potentially be used. Okay. So I am going to uh, give credit where it's due. There's a guy um, named Balaji Servician. It's something like that, his last name. Uh, he used to be the CTO of Coinbase. And the guy is brilliant. Like He's next level futurist brilliant. If, you were, if anyone went to like... Um, uh, write a boom a couple months ago and heard uh, Sunil talk. He's kind of like Sunil, like this ability to just like think 10 steps ahead of the rest of us. And he doesn't even care about what's practical or not. He's just talking about what should be. And um, he, if you want to listen to him, he's on um, the Tim Ferriss broadcast, uh, uh, Tim Ferriss show. He is regularly interviewed. I think he's been interviewed twice on that and he's just mind blowing. And so he was talking about this and I think there's a use case for it. So you look at this age of Okta and we've talked forever about, you know, zero trust, zero trust. And it's really just a marketing term, zero trust, right? Like I hate to hate on it, but it kind of is. And it's more of like a philosophy or a Zen of things. And yet we, you ask anyone to like define it and it doesn't really work, but I think where it, it gets its roots from and it gets its interest from is there's so much, um, what's the right word anger with like the the old school username and password and multi-factor world of like why can we not completely reset and go passwordless and have complete identity management where identity drives all access and that seems great until you have an octa style breach which is really bad news because now you put all your eggs in this zero trust basket and poof it all goes to nothing should something like that happen right well, why can we not give identity back to the hands of the commoners like me and you? And you just mentioned a second ago that blockchain is this capability of being able to like encrypt and decrypt things. So why can't I use blockchain to do something really innovative? Like I certify my own identity and I put that in an identity based blockchain and then I can give access or revoke access to anybody that I wish. And I don't even have to get access. Like, let's say I get hired at a new company. Now, all I have to do is say, the new company can say, we wish to request that your access be granted into these places. And they control what areas of access that gets, but I control my identity. And my identity is something I have full access to and full control over. And maybe in the future, like I have some reason I need to change it. And I need to recycle it. Well, because I'm the owner of it. You know, I could recycle it and rechange it. But like this idea of like a pseudo anonymity or pseudo minity is like a really cool idea to me that I think blockchain could really grant in the future um, that really gives someone like you or me the ability to have full control of our identity wherever we go and whatever we do. Because I think it's Ashley sort of blockchain. has taken what? your idea to the next level. Healthcare. Is what? Yeah. Yes. That's a great example. Because, you know, we all have medical charts, we all have data yep. inside those, you know, and being have, yep. being able to control that encryption uh, and, and that method of access to those individual files or those links to files um, is massive. Like, you know, hey, I want, I, I don't like you as a doctor anymore, you know, it's just not, I don't, I'm, you know, it's just not a, not a good partnership anymore, I want to go find a new doctor and 
revoke access and give access as as, as needed. Um, but it's me. Like I'm. No one can take my my quote unquote wallet ID, right? Um, the only problem with that is the recoverability. That has to be solved, um, because currently you can't recover a wallet ID if you don't have the backup tokens. Yes. Um, and if you don't have the backup token, it's gone forever. You lose the yep. hardware encryption key for your wallet, it's gone forever. Like that stuff, there has to be a way to recover it some form or fashion. So that's the only, that's the only, solve, that's the only problem I can see that needs solving, but I, the blockchain is 100% capable of, of doing this, especially with NFT technology. Because basically NFTs are just links to images anyway in a database. Um, so being able and, to- And that makes you wonder like, is there, the, the reason it's, it's gone when it's gone it's like the opposite of a bank. A bank is completely centralized, right? So like the bank has so much control over all, like you make a mistake and send a wire in the wrong place. As long as it's not fraudulent, you're going to be able to get the money back. No problems because the banking system is centralized. With crypto, it's totally decentralized. And to your point, you make one mistake, it's gone forever. You lose that key, you're, it's gone forever. You send it to the wrong place, the wrong address, it's gone forever. There's no one there to back you up. And it, it does make me wonder if there's maybe one of the areas of innovation we need to see is some kind of like middle ground to that, right? Um, maybe it's some kind of thing where like it's a decentralized authority of sorts that I grant access to with my data. I can revoke it at any point in time. But once I grant it to them, they're the custodians of it. So if I happen to lose my key or whatever, I can recover off of that. Like maybe maybe there's use cases there for some kind of middleware. Uh, but But yeah, no, I think that's where we may start to see innovation uh, is especially around identity management. That'd be a blockchain convenience as a service. <laughs> yeah, I see that in chat. Uh, yeah, it's good. Um, yeah. So that's enough about crypto. Uh, I love crypto, but it's not there yet. No, it's not there yet. Let's talk about something that I'm pretty sure you're familiar with, uh, considering okay. your background. Um, cyber insurance versus regulation. Okay. So regulation regulations on everyone's mind right um yep you know what's the government going to do louisiana has done things um but in my opinion like where there's a it nt itsp is that the acronym uh for uh the msps trying to regulate for internet you know for itsps um so, like, it's insurance is going to drive that market, yep. in my opinion. Um, yep. No one going up to a, and lobbying for a government official is going to be able to easily sway that market as, well, we're covering for this. We're paying for this. This is what we expect to cover our risk. That's going to drive it more so than someone going, well, we're we represent those people that you're covering. Um, what are, what is your thoughts and opinions on it? Well, I, uh, a, a few things on this. Um, I agree with you. Insurance, it is not a question. Uh, it is an answer. We know insurance will drive first, uh, but let's talk about regulation before we go to insurance. So regulation is coming. Um, I have dealt with regulators for many, many years now, and I know exactly how they operate. I know how they think. I've even been in DC and talked to regulators. Uh, I know how they operate. I know how they think. The way they think is, hey, look, we do want control. And regardless what side of the political spectrum you may exist on, the government wants to have control over things that they feel like is risky so that they can regulate into normalcy and they can regulate into some amount of control um, to reduce uh, this wild west world, right? <laughs> He's right. Uh, you got It's an untapped market and it's just chaos in the MSP space. You have tiny MSPs, you have mid MSPs, you have giant MSPs, and they're all playing against each other in a game that no one knows how to play. Um, this is going to be a great video to edit. <laughs> Wes says insurance like he's about to tell you about his invention, invention outsurance. 
uh beautiful uh it's beautiful it's it's lovely um oh i'm back hey it's double me hi guys again kyle here uh along with kyle um outer space kyle space kyle it's future kyle it's regular kyle and then it's future kyle Get Wes a new router. Go fund me. Yeah, uh, buy a shirt. I'll buy Wes a new router. Uh, Geico can save you 20% or more on your car insurance, only if you bundle with your home insurance. Um, Oh, is he back? He's back. Good. This time he's on the hotspot. So uh, I'm just done with my Wi-Fi for the day. (laughs) For the day. (laughs) That's ridiculous. Okay. What we were talking about bank. We were talking about, okay. We're talking about banking regs, banking Uh insurance, all that kind of stuff. Right. In the channel. Yes. Is that what we're talking about? Yep. Okay. Okay. So um, I think I, I have no idea where I cut off, but I, I do think regulation's coming for sure. There's no question that it's coming. Um, it's going to be further down the road. I have, I have had a lot of time in my career working with regulators, both FDIC, OCC, Fed, uh, and even though they're not regulators, they're on the authority sort of side of the house is, you know, um, um, on the uh, whatever you call that space, uh, like DHS. I've worked with them. I've even been in DC and I've talked to all these people before, right? And so regardless of like where you're at on the political spectrum, it doesn't matter. We know why regulation exists. Regulation exists because the government knows that they need to come in and they need to have to demonstrate some amount of control to cause stability in something that's a wild, wild west otherwise. And it it doesn't matter whether like you like regulation, you don't, there are areas you do or don't. That's why they regulate. Like that's, it's for protection. Um, it doesn't, we could argue all day long if it works or not. I don't care about that, but I do like, that's what happens. But the, the thing that they're so worried about, they're worried about, we don't want to over-regulate and destroy an industry because they've done it before. You look at banking, right? Banking is a great example of where they over-regulated way too much. And then what happened? FinTech happened. All of these like third-party stuff that fixes the problems that banks can't do to allow for better consumer access to money. And I don't think that's a bad thing at all. And I think if you pull a regulator to the side and you're like, hey, what do you think about fintech? Are you seeing why it's come out? And they're like, yes, you know, we know that we over-regulate. They're scared. So regulators are scared of that. They don't want to like quash innovation, but they also see these crazy things that are happening. They're like, we're going to have to get control on this. 100%. And so uh, here's an example. Any of you want to just on your computer, go look up uh, House Bill HR 2471. I'm looking at it right now. This is a, an appropriations act, sort of like an omnibus or a roll up of multiple things together. And inside of that, there is a, another one called um, a roll up of what originally was the, hold on, the Strengthening American Cybersecurity Act. And this got fed up and fed into this whole like Appropriations Act thing. And you can dive into it. But what's really interesting in it is it talks about um, notifications for um, uh, for federal government and for uh, critical infrastructure. And it now mandates and forces that within certain amounts of debt, like a certain threshold of days, you must notify the federal government if you've had a breach. And it explains what a breach is, all this kind of stuff. And the reason they want this in place, they even say it in the act, is we need better data. We need to know when our critical infrastructure in the nation has come under attack so that we can know and we can correlate and we can start to say, is this a sophisticated attack or is this a one-off thing? But here's what's super interesting, Kyle, inside of it for the very first time in federal regulation, they mention a managed service provider. And that term is sweeping. It's really big. Let me go see if I can find it for this us. This is quick. law. <laughs> yeah, this is law. Yes, this is law. Why well, haven't I heard this before? Uh, I'm it, st- it, I, I post because you don't read my LinkedIn. Lies. <laughs> I, I did post something this. on LinkedIn about it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, being funny, though. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Um, Let's see here. It's going to be a lot of searching, but if I can find it, um, 
Let's see. Managed service. The term managed service provider means an entity that delivers services such as a network, application, infrastructure, or security services via ongoing and regular support and active administration on the premise of a customer in the data center of the entity, such as hosting, or at a third party data center. There you go. That's a pretty broad term, isn't it? What do you think about that term as an MSP? Um, I mean that that covers a lot of a lot of. I mean, Amazon would be considered a managed service provider in instance if I have uh, one yeah. of my machines in the in the AWS or Google or Azure. Um, it, like managed network, like managed, like anything that anything that you're caught, you're, I guess, it's just anything you have access to, I guess. Deliver okay. services. That doesn't, that, that del <laughs> sim. <laughs> yep. I mean, that delivers services. Uh, yep. You'd be a managed service provider. That's, that's a pretty broad term. And it's, it's interesting because it's their way of sort of saying, we're going to make this a sweeping term, but we just, if there is any supply chain involved in this, we want to know. Uh, so does that mean like MSPs are regulated? Well, kind of yes and no, right? Like you don't have a regulation. There's no like regulator. You don't have like, you know, um, like for example, banks have FDIC and OCC and all these others. You don't have that. Uh, but you, you are now included in it because the law says so, <laughs> you know? So this is going to get interesting. It's got, uh, I think this is. It's got real interesting real quick. <laughs> um, because I, I like, that's just a snippet out of the, uh, out of the bill. That's not like what, that doesn't determine what they're regulating and they're classifying a managed service provider. They're not, they're not, it, I haven't got to the part to where they've determined what a managed service provider is responsible for, which I'm assuming is just reporting any breaches. Um, does it? Yeah. Do, you, do you know if they? Do you know if they limit it? Any? Any? To anything like DOD or like government officials, or is it? Well, any the, breach. Yeah. The the context who this is a, the authority for this is like government groups and a. And keep in mind, I'm not a lawyer, so and, and nor am I trying to practice or speak to any degree of expertise in like legislature, right? But um, from my understanding of this, it's written for sure for federal government and for critical industry. Um, so, you know, think of like, you know, some manufacturer that's in the DOD space, right? It's a great example of this. And um, if you have a managed service provider and they, they are involved in that breach because it happened from them or they're somehow tied into it, case in point, look at what happened with Okta. The government says, you're going to tell us about that. You're going to tell us who that MSP is. And you're going to tell us that the nature of their relationship inside of the breach. You're going to give us that information. We're going to now know about this. So they're not telling MSPs what to do, but they are saying you're now included. We know who you are. You're defined very broadly, I might add. And you're also now required to be um, uh, that information about you must be passed on to us in the middle of some kind of breach. So, so it's, it, this is the beginnings of things for sure. This tells us that the mighty government, those who actually write law and those that sign it into force to some degree or another have an understanding of what an MSP is. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. And it's also slightly worrying. Um, I mean, that broad of a definition is, you know, it, that encompasses anyone like backup providers, uh, like ConnectWise would be considered a managed service provider in this. Datto. Yes. Uh, Kaseya, the big four, like all of them. Yes. Microsoft, you know, not even with Azure, just in general. Um, yeah. So, uh, I, mean, I, I don't... It's, it's good from a, like a, from now we can under like if if that if that information is made public to where we can understand who's been breached and when and to what extent that's great for threat intel and for us to know that and to be able to put in uh safeguards that's great from that point but it's a really broad term it, it is you know and I, I think it's a beginning not an end uh and it doesn't mean that they can't redefine managed service provider 
MSP as a whole, um, broadly speaking across the board in, in other legislature, right? And it doesn't mean that they might not at some point assign an actual regulation, regulating agency that has authority over you. Like it doesn't mean those things also won't happen, but it just means to me, it's notable because you've been mentioned, you've been called out for the first time. And that's how the government rolls. They're super slow moving. And I'm glad they're slow moving. It means they're methodical and careful. Um, so now that you've been mentioned and now that you've been known, um, only more will come out of it, not less. Yeah. And they're going to be, they're going to be coming at us quick. Yes. Well, and, and it'll continue to ha- be quicker the more we continue to have these huge newsworthy supply chain attacks. Yeah. So Okta certainly didn't help. No. Um, and considering Okta does probably have government contracts and probably DOD or subcontractors who they work with, that's just going to, you know, tighten the noose on us much quicker than it probably should. Um, yep. But I mean, regulation has its pluses and minuses um, as yep. with anything. Like there's no perfect sense of regulation, but there's a lot of, I don't want to say bad MSPs, uh, immature MSPs in this space who don't properly understand security, who don't properly understand safeguards or disaster recovery or even how to manage stuff. Or they're, they're MSPs who haven't, take, who haven't evolved with the times, like, you know, someone's still supporting NT or XP or something like that, you know. Um, there's, and they're making, they're still making money, they're still profitable, they're still a, a good business they're just not requiring everything else everyone's requiring or need to be required so i think in that stance regulation's fantastic because they hurt the industry as a whole those individuals if they get breached or they have an incident that is bad for everybody not just i mean because it's not company a is exploited it's managed service provider who happens to be company a has been a target of a breach you know, it's it's that's how this that's sensationalism for media. I mean, it's just what we're it's where we're at now. It is what it is. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I, I I agree. I totally totally agree. Um, and you know, my experience with regulation in banking, um, I hope that some of the the same things happen, where you get a uh, a regulator that deeply understands the nature of the supply chain and is there to augment and support and secure and promote. Uh, I, it's not a bad thing. Sometimes regulation goes overboard, and of course, it's it it completely clamps down on innovation. But good regulation should be there to protect you and to give you the capabilities you need to survive and thrive. I'll give you an example of this. Um, you know, having a regulator, multiple regulator team of like sometimes uh, ten that come into your bank every twelve or eighteen month cycles, depending on how healthy your bank is, and they spend two weeks with me in IT diving into IT and security, and you have to show them everything. You can't hide anything from these guys. And they know what to look for, and they know what to ask for. And these guys have authority, and gals, and folks. These yeah. folks have authority, right? And like they, they can do some crazy things. If they find out that I'm negligent and I'm purposely... Now, this, this is a very rare occurrence, but you can actually see these. They're called FDIC. Um, I think they're called action letters, I think they're called. Uh, they exist. If you've been found negligent, they can come to you and say, Kyle, you are not, we have deemed you negligent. We are going to personally fine you. Uh, they can also say you are so negligent that you are now unable to work in the financial service industry of any kind ever again. And if you do, you will go to prison. Like that's crazy stuff. So when I first started dealing with regulators, my heart starts pitter pattering a little bit more. I almost feel like I got pulled over by a police officer. Like I felt like that in the early days because they're intimidating because of their authority. Um, but I learned very quickly that they never, never use that authority, never, because they don't need to. They come in and I like, I like them. And I'm like, hey, here's what we got going on. Of course, I've given them a big data download bef- like two weeks before they come in. But I sit down with them and I talk about them. I ask them what they think. I ask them what their advice is on these things. And I, I become very consultive with them. And I remember at one point, uh, I had a regular come in and, and uh, he said to me, and I remember what the issue was. The issue was uh, we didn't have 24-7 security monitoring. So this is like 2015, something like that. We had security monitoring, but not 24-7. And regulator was like, hey, anything I can, anything that stands out to you that I haven't seen and, and you know, what all we've done over the past two weeks? I'm like, yeah, I got one. 
He goes, what? I said, you know, so I walked him through of how concerned I was that we don't have 24 seven monitoring. If something's going to happen, it's going to be at 2am. I'm like, don't you agree? And the regulator said, yeah, I agree. Uh, and he goes, I think I can help you. He goes, I appreciate that you were so open about this. He said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to put this into my notes. And when I meet with the board, uh, and by the way, in his exit, he met with our board. And so he talked about, so like my board now knows everything we're doing good and bad from his view. And so he met with the board and he put it in the, in the notes of like, just follow up items. He's like, this is not a finding. This is just a thought that you guys might want to consider 24 seven security monitoring instead of like, you know, eight to five or whatever it was. Cause my board was cheap. Guess what happened? They agreed with it because the regulator said so. And I learned a great lesson that day of like pull regulators around with you and work side by side with them because they can help you do things that otherwise you could never do. And so if we get regulation, the channel, I want to see it be like that. Yeah, that'd be that'd be fantastic. Um, having allies versus enemies, right? You, they're there to to help you be better, not to to smack you in the head every time you do something wrong, right? Now yeah. they have the ability to smack you to do if you do something wrong, uh, because yeah. they need that ability. Yes, they um, need teeth. Uh, but they they're advised and trained and and encouraged to not unless it's deemed required. Um, yep. That is, I mean, that's, that'd be nice. Uh, I mean, Big Dog said it correctly. If regulation to check boxes is terrible. To protect you and your clients is great if done right, then everyone wins. Bingo. Exactly right. Oh, I found it, by the way. This is, you guys should take a look at this. It's like the HIPAA breach notification list. You know, like the who's who. You can go look local companies up and see who hit the list for HIPAA. Uh, FDIC is a little different. Theirs are called, uh, I said it was action letters. It's enforcement decisions and orders. So it's E D and O. Um, if anyone wants to have a lot of fun, go pull up FDIC, just Google for FDIC uh, enforcement decisions. And there is a search that exists in this and you can go look this up and you might find local people that you happen to know or local banks or local check cashers or whatever. I think it's kind of interesting. Um, this is what regulation does, right? And I don't think it's a bad thing. Okay, so let's go back into um, insurance, though. Mm -hmm. Insurance is already in motion. So if we take a reverse a little bit of what's happened in the past two years, you know, all of these major insurance carriers, and I had this, um, if you search for uh, cyber insurance loss ratios, I think is just the term. Yeah. The first link I get is from insurance journal. And I'm looking at this right now. So this, this data comes from NAIC. So this is, this is accurate data. This is vetted accurate data. Um, some of these, like you look at, I'm just going to name some off some carriers off. Um, so Chubb, Chubb is the number one cyber insurance carrier that's out there, at least here in the, in the States. Uh, they wrote $404 million of premiums um, last year. 2020, their loss ratio, you want to take a guess what their loss ratio was? This is like how much, how much they lost, like the percentage of loss out of everything they wrote for coverage. 57%. You, you just about nailed it. 61%. Yep. <sighs> uh, number two is uh, AXA, AXA, 98%. Number three, American International Group, 100.6%. It's not really even possible to go over your loss ratio. So I don't know where the 0.6 came from. It must be like admin costs that got added in or something. Um, so this is staggering. Those three right there, they make up uh, about a third of the entire market share of cyber insurance. That's and so scary. when you see, yeah. And so when you see like Joe Cyber and some of those other folks on like our like Reddit um, RMSP and they're talking about the huge pullback from insurance carriers um, of like they're, they're not renewing MSPs. They're not doing tech ENO at all anymore. Uh, they are, if they do, you're going up 4X the cost with zero claims. It's because the loss ratios blew up and went, just went bonkers. And the reason it went bonkers is because you look at any of, I actually have access to um, a list of like, um, we're calling it the Lord of the apps, which is like, you know, like a summation of a whole bunch of applications for cyber insurance altogether. And I've, it's a legal list. I didn't like go steal it or yeah. something. We actually have access to this. Um, I'm advising a company that's going to do some really big things in the cyber insurance space. And um, you look at what's asked about this. And so many of the questions are really vague. 
you know, some are like, do you have a firewall? Do you have like AV, you know, things like that. But many of them, like, you know, do you have a process for this? Do you have, a, you know, a, do you have methods for that? Sure, I do. Right. And how much does that even matter? And how much of it are we even measuring? Like none. And so one of the problems that we have in the insurance space as a whole is like, you know, why is it that cyber insurance is like the redheaded stepchild to use an old colloquial term, right? Like if I am, you know, you, you know, this in the cyber, in auto insurance, right? If I say I'm this gender and I say I'm this age and I say I live in this demographic and I say I drive this car and I drive this many miles, I have data. I have actuary tables that they can scientifically go in and say, we charge you this much and we know our margins and we'll never be wrong in the aggregate. And cyber insurance, psh, <laughs> that does not exist, right? That does not exist. It's too new of a um, field to have that kind of data It's way too new set. of a field. That's right. And they don't even know. And I can tell you this because I've talked to a bunch of them. They don't even know how to assess cybersecurity. They paid for some person to come in and build them an application. Like, these are the questions you should ask. And they're terrible. They're not measured by any data at all. None. And so this is why we have loss ratios that just went bonkers is because of all this. So here's what's happening in the industry. You're now seeing uh, new requirements that are going to come in. And these new requirements are going to force not just MSPs, but they're going to force clients as well on like just regular cyber policy. They're going to force new things. So like EDR is a big thing. You're going to see every insurance carrier that's out there mandate EDR. So good luck, MSP. Actually, not good luck. Get ready, MSPs. For the first time in your life, you're going to have the easiest time ever selling EDR. Because you're going to go to your clients and say, you can't even be covered. And I, as an MSP, am not going to deal with you as a client when you have no cyber insurance coverage and you have a breach and you had no EDR, you have no coverage. And if, if, if there's, you're just stuck, you're up the creek without a paddle. My tech, you know, is not going to cover that because I didn't click on the virus. Uh, so, so you're going to have to have it. And guess what they're going to do? Fine. <laughs> right. I guess I'll get it. You know, and they'll complain and they'll foot stomp. But then they're going to get it. They're going to move on. They're going to forget about it and have a great quarter. And they, they you, you now, are, you, the, the, the needle has moved in a better way. Yeah. And so now we have this stick. We have this bad guy that we can point to. It's not my fault. It's the insurance guys. They're tired of paying out and they're not doing this for free. You have to have it. Okay, fine. I'll get it. Like, I'll, I'll get it. So this is where we're going. I actually don't think it's a bad thing. So new requirements. So things like EDR or MDR, some kind of like 24 seven overwatch is becoming a big, big deal. Um, I think that's a good thing. And then the other thing we're seeing is you're going to have to start showing data. You can't just tell things. You can't just say, well, I said this in the app and I'm good. You're now having to actually, you're going to have to start showing data to them uh, to prove things. Um, you know, like, um, this like the state farm and all the rest of them have the little beacon you put in your car and yeah. it measures you. So I know you, you, I, you told me you, you plug these, it in and it tells you the data. speed now I know. and how often you break yes. and things like yes. that. Because there's certain things, a, an application and demographic data can never tell me, right? You may be a middle-aged, you know, person living in Chicago that's driving a XYZ, but I still don't know if you still have this old school mentality from high school, like, you know, you're tearing Before, it up on the roads yeah. and, coming off two wheels when you turn. I don't know until I measure, right? And and so this is where we're getting into cyber insurance as well is you're going to have to start measuring and they're going to they're going to have ways to do that. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I'm all for measuring cuz at the end of the day, you can't really proceed to the future as an MSP if you can't measure yourself and you can't measure your clients and you can't measure what you're doing and how you're doing it. Like there's there's there it's it's a requirement. Like it's it's ridiculous that a lot of MSPs ignore that data set that they have and i mean insurance companies aren't not for profit they're for profit they're so for profit it's ridiculous um and they're going to make their money and either they jack up the prices or you you pay them money or you pay someone else money but they're going to reduce their risk one way or the other and that's that's it. All it is to them is a risk game. They're playing the margin. There's like a, a giant gambling addict. They're playing the margins. Either you know it's twenty percent risk, but you know if if it hits, then it hits. But the majority of the time, it's not going to hit. And I'm just going to make bank. I'm just going to roll in it. Um, yep. And it. I mean, it's, honestly, it makes sense. It's, it's another one of those. It's like it's regulation. You you need you got to have that. You got to have those clients who are stubborn enough to ignore things like EDR and MFA and. Uh, the easy stuff, like 
don't click on stuff. Fishing training, sat stuff. You know, it's people don't always realize how important this stuff is from a an overview standpoint. And being able to, you know, have someone and just you know, being able to point to the bad guy, like you said, it's it's super important because I'm not the bad guy, he is. But you still should do this. <laughs> It gives you extra leverage as an MSP to be able to, to, to push those things that clients need. Agree. So advice for MSPs um, before we go to the next topic. Um, I, I, I see this clearly. Um, you're not an agent, right? So no one is telling an MSP that you need to become an insurance agent. You, you can't. It's not going to happen. And so we're not, no one is saying that you got to like no rates and you got to quote for them. No one's saying that. But what I'm saying is, the age has come where you must work with your clients in the insurance game. You don't have to be the ones to sell it because you can't, but you got to be involved in what they have and what they don't have. You got to help them because if you're the IT provider, you're the one that's primarily delivering all the services that are required and necessary should a claim eventually come. And so MSPs are now in the era that they're going to have to learn in their QBRs or whatever the motion is to say, Hey, can we talk, let's talk about insurance. Let's make sure, you know, what, what level of client, you know, what level of coverage do you have understanding, you know, a list of like, here's all the, the limits you have and understanding uh, uh, do any stand out that are potentially wrong. You don't have to be the ones to say it's right or wrong. You just have to look for red flags. And then you also have to look for red flags around what they're saying they're doing, which versus what they're actually doing. Right. Because they may not know to Tim's point in chat, uh, he or Zaf's point, he's like, you know, they define a firewall. It could be a Linksys router, right? So your job is to really go through and make sure that those things are in place. And you probably want to even know some, some insurance brokers that are out there that if they don't have insurance or you're worried that it's not good enough, that you have a way, and this is not something you're going to make money on because you can't make commission by like bringing a broker into a service. And I've talked to a lot of MSPs like, yeah, but how do I make money out of this? I'm like, I know that's the knee jerk, but this is not something you can make money on. This is something that you're going to reduce risk on. And you will important. make money if new requirements are there like EDR, like we talked about. But that's my advice is learn to get comfortable enough with insurance because you got to engage your clients in it. You must, if you're not doing that, then you're going to get yourself into a world of trouble when the incident occurs. So do you believe that the cybersecurity insurance uh, grouping as a whole is kind of grim right now or the future of it? Or do you think that it'll fix itself because people are starting to get more data and more understanding of what risks really are? So that's a good question. It's a hard market right now. And what a hard market sort of means is like, you know, a lot pulling back, costs going up, not a lot of control around what's happening. We're in a hard market, no doubt, um, but that will soften. And the way it will soften is when we finally get to this stage where we can better assess security and prove that we can reduce loss ratios, we're, that's going to be the next thing that you're going to see happen is you're going to see insurance start to figure this out and react. And you're going to see two, three, four different methods of that working. And then everyone else is going to follow suit and doing the same kinds of things, like how we measure it, all that kind of stuff. Then we're going to see loss ratios go down. And then we're going to see much more um, calmness back into the market because there's too much money in this for them to just totally back out. Okay. They're not backing out forever. They're backing out for now because they have to. And here's my prediction. IT Nation Secure you're going to see at least three or four cyber insurance or insurance related companies that are going to be there. Not all will be insurance. Some of them will be the measurers that are there. Right. Uh, but you're going to see them there. You're just, I'm just telling you, you're going to see them there because they understand how important the MSP is to all of this. Interesting. I'll be there. I'll, I'll look can, for them to see. see. Yes. Um, Cause that's, that, I mean, it's, it's, they're in the, they're in the space. They've been in the space, but they haven't, they've just like, they've dipped their toe in. Right. Um, and there is a ton of money in cybersecurity insurance here. Like there's, you got, you can insure the MSP and you can insure the client. And that is a lot of money potentially to be made as long as the risks are, are, are where they need to be. Um, so one question in chat, can I read this one? So, um, is the future of cybersecurity grim or is there a hope that it'll get better when it finally becomes data driven? So I try to be the optimist, right? Like I try to be the optimist CISO, um, that's out there. Cause there are none. Um, but I hate to say it. Like, I still think it's grim. We're, we're, I hate to be that Debbie downer, but the thing is, it's not going to be grim for everybody, right? Like 
uh, I think if you put hygiene in place, you know, like for example, we talk about this, the CIS controls, you go through implementation group one and you have like 70% coverage of all of the attack types that, you know, you see in MITRE attack. I still don't fully believe that like, it doesn't mean you're, they're not, you're invulnerable to them, but it does so much for hygiene. Um, so I think there's a lot of room for hope, especially if you're an SMB or an MSP and you're doing the hygiene things that are critically important. Um, I think there's hope in terms of things getting better from that degree, but there's way too much um, still bad practice, lack of care, um, and really bad hygiene a- around all of us. So I'm still in the grim category to answer that question. I mean, that's fair. I mean, it's still scary. Like they're, they're, the risk is still too high for them. They don't really have enough information. Um, so let's, let's talk about things I am not at all familiar with. Uh, so this is this, I am super excited about this next topic. Um, the MSP market, uh, involves at a, what I would consider rapid pace. Um, normal IT companies don't necessarily have to deal with all of that comes through it. They usually get the back end after everything's been solidified and things have been more mature as products go and. AV, EDR, XDR, like what is this space turning into? Like what is, because AV is no longer enough. It hasn't been enough for a long time. EDR is still relatively new as a product scope goes, and it's still maturing as a product. What is XDR? So we have a, let me start with this. We have a problem in security in that um, we tend to make up terms that mean whatever you want them to mean. Uh, we just kind of were joking about that with zero trust, right? But in the world of IT, we don't do that as much. Like if you're like, yo, Wes, I need a hard drive and I give you a GPU, you're going to laugh at me because there's a clear difference between what a GPU and a hard drive or a CPU is. Clear difference. Um, or even in like our protocols, there's a huge difference between what TCP is versus UDP, right? Massive difference. Um, but yet, in the security space, we use all these terms that are like, I don't know, they, they, they meet, they, they are very fluffy and they're not really widely, um, but they're widely known and accepted. But again, you bring, I guess your litmus test is this. If you bring five people in the room, they're all experts and ask them what a term is. And they all give you pretty varying degrees of difference. You got a marketing term, not a scientific term, right? And that's a problem. So if you look at like the, so I just want to throw that out there. So if you look at that evolution, we all know what AV is like classic AV is nothing but hash checking. That's literally all it's doing. It's Mm -hmm. just, do I know this is bad because I've seen it before? Um, Okay. We always, we know why that's bad. I remember back in 2013, back when ransomware was like, not even cool. I did a conference. I was at a conference at FS ISAC, the financial services ISAC. It was like 300 people in the room and I showed them ransomware and I showed them a fully updated AV and I downloaded it from one of those ransomware as a service things. It was one of the earliest ones that was out there. Um, so it's freshly new, freshly crypted, and it completely owned my machine. And they were like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that. And you had fully running antivirus. I'm like, yeah, because antivirus is not going to see any of this kind of stuff. So then we get into this behavioral kind of stuff, all the heuristics. And then you see, and I'm just going to call a name out there because they're who they are now is not who they were back then. But Silence in those days really saw a market opportunity and they brilliantly attacked this with a lot of... Um, I would say underhanded stuff. So what they started doing was they started saying, hey, look at, and you can still see the old YouTube videos. They were particularly calling out Sophos and they made all these videos of like, they're like, hey, look, we're going to virus total and we're downloading all the, like the top 100 latest PSEXEs. And then we're going to automatically just run them all all together, just run them all, boom. And then we're going to see how Sophos fires and handles it. And then we're going to see how Silence fires and handles it. And of course, Silence stopped them all. And then Sofo stopped like half of them, something like that. And they're like, see, our product is better because we have AI that does all of this. Well, in the aftermath, uh, a couple of Sophos guys got a little frustrated with this because they discovered that they had turned a ton of Sophos like security checks off to do this. And they basically forced Sophos into like hash checking only. So of course it's going to miss. In fact, the fact that it had like half detections was mind blowing to me, right? Like that was not bad uh, if it's just AV checks, right? And, and But it kicked off this firestorm among all these like security practitioners like, yo man, y- y- y'all got any of that, that AI stuff? Because I need some of it, right? And so all of a sudden these like AI driven next gen AV started coming out that everybody had to have their hands on because they're so good at stopping the unknowns. 
And my view is like, man, if it were really stopping all the unknowns, wouldn't you see these like these next gen AVs that are out there putting out press releases every single day of this unknown, crazy threaty threat that they found? Of course they're not. And you talk to anybody, like I have a good friend that does red team stuff for enterprise. And he's like, give me an EDR and I will bypass it. He says, I know it because I've bypassed them all. He goes, he used to work for, I can't say who, but he worked for a stupidly important um, for-profit company um, that is in the financial services space. And uh, he told me, he's like, he goes, we own every EDR that's out there. And the reason we own them all is because we use them for different use cases and different purposes. My, my job is to bypass them. And he says, I can tell you exactly how to bypass these things. And I remember um, with Silence going back to them in the early days, um, I remember a researcher had a very simple like um, HTA file, you know, like um, for like web stuff. And he had the HTA file pull up PowerShell and then PowerShell did the nasty and Silence completely missed it. Why did it miss it? Because its AI was not trained to look for any of that kind of stuff. So it was like worthless. Like all this marketing was worthless at the end of the day because any half bit attacker could see this stuff. So I'm going on a huge rant here, (laughs) but this is the problem with security. Like it's marketing and it doesn't mean anything. And you put something technical in front of it and it falls apart. So this is where we're at today, right? And EDR is awesome and you need EDR and AV is not enough. And EDR is a better accepted term than a lot of things we have that's out there. But I'm much, I'm so glad we finally got off a stupid next gen AV kick and we call EDRs what they are, which is EDRs. And all EDRs are doing- Endpoint detection and response. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Endpoint detection and response. Yes. And of which Silence is one, by the way, I was picking on them, but they're, they don't do the things they used to. They've learned from those mistakes. They they have, and they're under new ownership, all that kind of stuff. So like, that's why I can pick on them because um, it's a different company today. So, so, but EDRs are good. Like there are different varying differences to them for sure. But like what they're really good at is getting better hooks into what's happening at the OS level. And then giving you better data that comes out of it where people get trapped with EDRs, especially in the channel is it can see all this stuff and alert on all this stuff that may or may not be malicious. And you as an MSP don't have the expertise or the meatware to be able to handle it, right? Like I can't handle the load of alerts it's getting me. So I'm just in its automatic mode. If it knows it's bad, it'll automatically shut it off. Everything else I don't touch. And so that's the problem we have in EDRs today is they've given us so much more rich data, but we're not doing anything with it largely because we don't point, have a team of people it's a looking over hash it. check right it's just back to where you were um, or some amount of decision based criteria yeah. like i'm not totally hating on ai you know but all ai is is just decision tree tables you know it's a whole yeah. bunch of if thens if, if that then I, else yep yep so so they can be really useful in finding badness but um they're going to miss things as well for sure and that's why companies like huntress are so freaking awesome because what they're like they base Basically, Kyle basically took NSA threat ops that he was doing and just channelized it, right? And so he's like, I don't, I don't care about having to have some AI something or other. I'm just going to find badness because I know how badness works. I know how it looks and I know what to go for in order to do what I'm looking for, right? And so, um, yeah, this is, this is, um, this is where yeah. we're at. So Huntress isn't an ADR. It's more of after yeah, ADR. <laughs> uh, yeah, new terms. Um, and yeah. I know they purchased a company who does an ADR, but and they're here, working here, on integrating. Here's it, the right? thing that's good, though. Yeah, I think I I have no inside knowledge of them, none. But I would assume that you'll see them have an EDR at some point, right? But um, I have no knowledge of that. But here's what's awesome: we got to. And I'm not saying you do this because I know you don't. Uh, but we got to stop thinking about attacks being like push button get malware, like ransomware. What's great about having, and it doesn't have to be Huntress. It could be a lot of other things that are out there too. Um, even Perch was good at a lot of these things, right? So there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of EDR, a lot of EDRs can do this kind of stuff, but like sometimes we can catch badness before the actions on objectives take place. And if you, you don't know what I mean, go look at, you can, you guys can Google the um, Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. And it's a way of expressing in a way an attack starts with like reconnaissance and then weaponization, then exploitation, and then lateral movement. I'm working off memory here. I probably missed a couple of things. But then eventually you get to escalation and actions on objectives. And there's time that that takes. And so if I can find a foothold 
and I can kill out and remediate that foothold before something really bad happens, then I never have the actions on objectives. And so that's what's so great about like even after incident attack, like this goes into the right of boom stuff that Sunil talks about of like structural awareness versus uh, situation awareness mm -hmm. of like, if I can see my situation has changed, I can take action before something really bad happens. And that's what we need. That's what's so critical that EDRs can grant us. Oh yeah, no, that's that's the valid point. Like it's everyone, you know, it, it, you, it's not just a, when someone's attacking you, they don't look, they don't go, okay, I'm gonna, uh, Wes, I don't like you. I'm gonna attack you. I'm gonna hack you. They, they throw out the net and whatever comes back, they target that massive amount of stuff that's come back. And then they narrow their scope until they start throwing footholds out. And it's, we're still talking about hundreds of thousands of machines or methods or people that they're targeting at once. It's not, it's not like a specifically targeting company A or B. They're just, this is found in my net. It's a potential vector. I'm going to try it until that vector is no longer working. And then I'm out. It, I'll just, I got other things I can look at, right? It's, there's too many easily accessible footholds to not, to, to, to keep attacking people who haven't fallen for the easy stuff, right? Um, there's so many companies that are just have 3389 open, <laughs> yep. uh, who have passwords leaked in giant passwords list that you can just blanket brute force to millions of different industries and services it's it's you know that's it's super easy to do that stuff um yeah exactly and this is why we have this age of access brokers that literally exist in the in the cyber supply the cyber crime supply chain that sell access to people that can use it to your point all they're trying to do is get footholds everywhere and then they find something they don't want to operationalize it. they just want to sell it and then some threat actor purchases it this happens all the time uh, it's exactly right. And then one person in chat said, sometimes they get a sniper too, though. Plenty of companies get targeted because of who they are or even the type of business like <laughs> MSBs, he said, or she said, uh, that's exactly right. Um, is uh, e e target targets of opportunity. We, it, it perch, we call those Buffalo jump attacks, right? Like uh, it's old native American hunting technique. They learned instead of like, I got a spear like in a bone atlatl, right? Like it's hard to kill a, a Buffalo, but they learn if you just push them off a cliff, well, it's much easier. And that's exactly what bad guys are doing. They're leveraging the MSP as a Buffalo jump to push a whole bunch of clients off. Right. And, and it forces you to negotiate and pay higher amounts. Right. So yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, it goes both ways for sure. Yeah. Oh, but... and we didn't even talk about XDR, right? So like you have EDR and then you have MDR. MDR is like, think of it as like managed EDR is the best way to look at it, but there's different kinds of MDR. Like Perch was an MDR. Um, Black Point Cyber is an MDR. Scout. Um, uh, 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 there's a whole bunch of these that are out there. Even uh, Blue, uh, Blue Mira is a good example where Jeremy Young is at now. There's a lot of these um, MDRs that are out there that are providing that overwatch. But then one term that I hate, so like if EDR is a pretty accepted term and really pretty well-defined as far as security goes, MDR is a little weaker. Like we, we largely know it's got people watching over on top, but the mechanics of the MDR could be a little different. But then we have XDR. And it's like everything fell off a cliff. Um, XDR is terrible. It, it, I hate the term. I just do. So like XDR, and I was even looking at a, a definition. So let, let me just read you this definition. XDR is a more evolved, holistic, cross-platform approach to endpoint detection response. EDR collects and correlates activities across multiple endpoints, but XDR broadens the scope of detection beyond endpoints and analyzes data across endpoints, networks, servers, cloud workloads, SIM, and much more. Uh, so, so it's a SIM. It's, yeah, it's, it's like a SIM a, with a built-in EDR. <laughs> so it's still an MDR, but what it's doing is giving you better visibility because I guess the old MDRs are so crappy, we couldn't be known as them. So we had to create a class for ourselves. That's literally what they're saying. Yeah. Uh, and I hate that, right? I, I can't stand that kind of stuff in security. It makes me want to like, it doesn't make sense. Not do security. Like, it, it, yes. like what you're trying to encompass the everything DR, you're trying to encompass a SEM, AV, EDR, network management, and monitoring. Like that, it's, you know, it goes back to one of those things. If you wear too many hats, you can't do anything effectively, right? And that's, that's what it looks like to me. Like, there's a reason why Huntress. They honed their craft and they're fantastic at what they do and they don't claim to do anything different. Um they they're 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 
it, 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 it analyzes the sim. <laughs> yeah. If, if no was a, no one, if someone's watching the watchers, who's there to watch the watchers? Like, what is that? That saying goes. Yeah. 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 Um, it's exactly right. So yeah, I, man, and, and imagine being a decision maker in the org, right? Like at the board level, or even a decision maker for your client, and they're like, well last year you said I needed this EDR thing and now it's MDR. And then like the year after that, now it's XDR. And all I hear is like terms, like, do you really like a lo- the way a lot of them think about security is like, we're a bunch of like weirdos that have this iron cyber cauldron and we chuck stuff in and we stir it and we see what potions come out. And it's like, we're always wanting the next new potion. Um, that's a problem in security. Right. Um, I agree. I, it, it definitely is an issue that we got to solve for. Let me ask you a question. AV, all but useless. The best AV is Microsoft Defender. Any complaints so far? Like from me, like, do I disagree with that? Yeah, would you disagree with that statement? No, uh, Defender's, Defender is great. From um, an AV a, specifically perspective. Yeah, Defender's great. Because uh, my family but asks keep me in mind, I'm not like a red team guy. Yeah. Like, you'd be better off asking somebody much more True. Um, offensive than me. But... At the end of the day, if they're all the same, the best one's free. So what are your thoughts on Defender Endpoint? Uh, the next level, the, the EDR version of Defender and the... Have you played with or experienced any of those in their, capaci- the, their capacities? Do you think they're better than some of the EDRs that currently exist on the market? So. Um... Here's a good way of looking at it. Um, if you, so I, if you put me in like a little two, two engine Cessna or even a single engine Cessna, um, I've, I've done enough pilot training to where I'm confident I can put the throttle up, keep the pedals steered, keep it straight and pull up. Right. And I can, I can probably in a pinch, if like someone's really walking me through it, maybe I can land it. I'll probably I might survive, right? I don't just totally nosedive the plane, but you put me in a, like a, like a jet, you know, a big passenger jet. I can't even take off, right? There's no way. There's no way. I don't even know how to start. I've looked at those, like no, no clue how to start. And I think you have to be, it's the same. I'm not saying that that analogy is exactly akin to like what, um, uh, the, like the, everything defender can do, but I am saying you really have to evaluate and think, what are my capacity to get value out of the tool that I'm advocating for? And if I don't have that capability and I can't do it, then I need to find ways that I can, I can shop that out and, and have it managed, right? Have someone that can actually put the eyes on glass with the expertise that I need. And there's a lot of avenues you can go to get that solved for, right? So that's my view on it is just because it's much more powerful and gives you much more visibility doesn't mean that it's going to be any more secure uh, if you don't have the capability to use the tool you just acquired. Sound advice. Very sound advice. I mean, it's, it's true. I mean, I guess it goes with any product, not necessarily AV or Defender or EDR, XDR, or anything like that. If you can't support it and understand it, then it's almost useless. Yep. Because if... That's right. If, like, Huntress, if you... Because I know I'm familiar with Huntress. If they open a ticket for you and say, hey, this is a problem. Here's how to fix it. Would you like us to fix it? Cool. Yes, please but they give me the option and I understand I can look at their steps that they're taking because they're recommending this is the steps I take. And it's, it's stuff like that, that is just, it, it, you just got to understand it. It's the same way with the soccer SM. You, if a ticket comes out your way and says, Hey, we detected this nine times out of 10. If you're not, you don't have the capability or the knowledge or the bandwidth to even do it. You're just going to close it and move on with your life. Unless it says yep. ransomware, right? <laughs> yep. Unless it... uh, good, good comment here that I want to pull out from mm-hmm. chat because they're exactly right. And I, I think I, I probably, I could have spoken a little bit better. Um, so uh, Darren, I think it is, says, I think if you're going to get an EDR anyway, and you are, you should bundle it with your AV, like Carbon Black, Silence, CrowdStrike, whatever. But I do agree. You have to understand you, your EDR. Totally agree with that. As much as AVs don't do a ton, they do some. 
and uh, the compliance check marks of requirements to have it. And a lot of EDRs are actually certified AV anyway. Mm -hmm. um, they're doing both of the same thing. So I told that's a great comment that that person made, and I totally agree with them. Um, and I want to make sure that's clear too. I'm not saying dump your AV altogether. It's you know you you need I'll to have it. both. I'll say yeah, it. just dump it. You got it. You got Defender. With everything moving yeah. to the cloud, you get Defender with yeah. P1 or with uh, your office essentials license, whatever it's they're calling it nowadays. Um, Azure AD and all that. It comes built in with Defender. Dump <laughs> As, if, as yeah. long as your client has that. Don't, I mean, you got to have some type of something. Security yeah. is important in layers. And if your AV comes bundled with the solutions you're already providing with your client, there's no need to outsource an AV. Yep. Agree. Um, so you've given me a term, uh, an acronym uh, called SOAR. Yep. Um, what is SOAR? What is it defined as? And why is it important for me? Okay. So every time you ask me a question, I've seen that I, I pivot a little off track and then I come back to it and I'm do that again. Um, in the channel, one thing I've noticed, learned this in my perch days, uh, and, and I, you see this left and right, you see it is the channel is about five to seven years behind the industry, like large in, in industry, uh, enterprise. So if you look at what was hot five to seven years ago, these are the things that are creeping into the channel. So an example of this would be sore. There, and I'll explain what it is in a minute, but there are, were all these sores that spun up about five to seven years ago and all sold about last year. It's amazing. Like I'm telling you, this happens. Oh, SIM was the same way when we started, when we started Perch and really pivoted into being a SIM. Is, so, so if you ever want to like wonder what's going to be the next hot thing, just go back five to seven years ago in Enterprise and you know what was on the trade show floor at like Red Hat or uh, RSA and Black Hat is what's going to become popular. And there's lots of reasons for that that we won't go into tonight, right? Um, so SOAR is an example of this. SOAR stands for like security, orchestration, automation, and response. And it was born out of the mistakes we made in SIM. And, and here's what I mean. Like, so SIMs are great. So, so SIMs themselves came from security information and security event managers, right? Like in the old iterations, like we were like, hey, we should, we have all these logs that are being written. We should probably store them somewhere. And so that was like these systems that we would set up to just store logs. I and mean, if you had to go back and search, it was slow, but you could go look for some rudimentary things. And then all of a sudden we got smart, like, hey, there's rich data in the logs, both for IT stuff and like, you know, just to stay on top of things and security stuff. So all of a sudden the SIM was born and the SIM was like, you know, promoted as like the last security tool you'll ever need because you're going to dump all the information in your ecosystem and your world into it. And it's going to have all these awesome alerts and things that you find and use and whatever. Right. And so SIMs were hailed as like, this is the final solution in security because it's the nervous system and everything. Well, what did we learn about that? We learned that, wait a second, these things are generating with all the sprawl. We have a whole lot of information, a lot of data, and we can't see everything. And, and, and oftentimes when we do finally have an alert that's something real and we need to take action on it, it's too late. Um, or if it's not too late, it takes too much time. And so the SIM analysts that are hunting and looking for data are not the ones that push the buttons. And so we have this whole gap in response and recovery, which is a problem because the NIST cybersecurity framework, those are like the last two pillars, identify, protect, detect. We're pretty good at those now. We used to be terrible at detect, so now we're better at it. Response, recover, we're terrible at those things as MSPs. We're just not good at it. Uh, and so that's a problem. And so SOARs came out to fix the problem of the SIM. And SOARs build themselves as we bring cost control back to the SIM. For the first time, you can actually respond in an automatic way to all the things that happen. And you can free up your time and recover your TCO and all these great things. And finally, the SIM is valuable. Like that's how they were pitched. And if you want examples of SOARs that are out there, go take a look at Phantom, Demisto, Swimlane. Um, there's a bunch of these that were out there that all sold to like bigger SIMs or bigger, like one of them sold to um, uh, uh, Palo Alto, for example, um, Splunk bought Phantom, I think I can't remember. Anyway, they sold for like hundreds of millions, these, these sores. 
the thing about sores are they suck. <laughs> like they especially suck in the channel because here's what happens with a sore is the sales, the salesperson pitches you on what I just said. And you're like, I'm sold. I want this. Sounds and good. And they deliver it to you. What was that? Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds good. Right. They deliver it to you with your integrations into your, your SIM of choice. And they're like, cool. Now you can automate. And you're like, whoa, wait, 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 wait. It doesn't do anything. No, no, no. It's, it can do everything. You just have to do it. And you're like, well, where do I start? How do I do this? What's next? How do I actually, what, what do you mean? Like you just start building it. That's how enterprise works. And they're like, oh, if you don't need that, we can pro serve you. And so, you know, for another $250,000, you know, we'll, we'll put pro services on this and we'll get a bunch of things set up for you. Right. And, and you, you don't have your own in-house devs that can do all of this. It's like they built the tool. Kit. It's like they give you the tools and the raw lumber, but you can't, it doesn't have a house that comes with it. You got to build the house. So it's like laptop. So yeah, <laughs> no comment on those things. Uh, uh, but I, but yeah, I mean, this is the problem, right? And so what a SOAR is supposed to do is things like, hey, the, you know, we saw uh, the firewall saw an outbound policy, whatever, that looked like it was nasty. The SOAR, the SOAR gets that information from an alert in the SIM, and then the SOAR would go and orchestrate something to another security tool. Or another example is the EDR trips and goes off. And so that goes over to however you do your software deployment stuff. And it literally isolates that machine and wipes it to a known good state with no human interaction at all. Like these are things sores can do and they're awesome, right? Uh, but they also suck really bad because they can't, they, they take tons of time to build out. And so um, there's there are some companies that are out there that are exploring what does sore look like in the channel. I mentioned Blue Mira a little bit. So I know Jeremy Young, he's a friend of mine. Um, Blue Mira is trying to sort Very of see like guy. what, yeah, he's great. Jeremy's great. You need to have him on this call sometime. Um, and so I don't know a lot about it because I've never seen Blue Mira. I literally know nothing about it. I just know in talking to Jeremy and seeing some of the literature, they're exploring what does SOAR look like. And I think where you'll see success in SOAR in the channel is going to be, you know, maybe it is a fully open platform that you can do anything you want in, um, but it's much more going to be focused on use cases, you know, rather than just the open hook platform, you can do anything you want. And so Roost is doing this, right? If you haven't seen Roost, um, I'm advising them as well. And, and so Roost is sort of becoming a SOAR in the sense of like, you know, for example, Roost can say, hey, if I see multi-factor is turned off, um, I can notify you and I can create a ticket if you want me to, but I can also just flip it back on. Um, or I could have a timer wait a day and a half and then it notifies you and like teams and then closes it, turns it back on and then closes the ticket. So there's no human analyst at all. Um, so, so this is where I think you're gonna see success in SOAR is not an open SOAR that like you just go buy a phantom and hope it works. It's much more going to be very custom SOARs that, that have a lot of playbook stuff that are already been pre-built and sort of pre-canned. That's where I think we're going to see success. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that makes sense. That's from, from an MSP perspective, you're, you're saying all the correct things. You're talking dirty to me uh, in my native language, and it's fantastic. But I already can feel that the call, you're gonna, I'm going to have to pay for this. Like, it just feels expensive. Uh, and just an initial cost, like not even the hours I'm going to have to have someone dump into who's obviously going to have to be smarter than me because I'm not going to be able to do that. Um, so that, that's going to be an expensive resource and it's, it's fantastic. Like, I hope that comes in. I mean, it's automation is the lifeblood of MSPs. That's what's, that's what makes you money. That's what, that's how you, that's how you succeed. Um, and the more automation you can put in with just simple things, things that need to have automation, that should have automation as you're building the product, uh, cough, sims, cough, um, then, you know, it's just, just, even nowadays, like, you know, let's just go to the next topic because robotic process automation, RPAs, like that's, that's a thing that's happening. That's a thing that's coming and they're fantastic. Um, and to, to be transparent, I'm also advising Roost, uh, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's simple. Like it's taking difficult situations and difficult things and automating things. Because at the end of the day, if a process is repeatable by a human, it's repeatable by a robot. And 99% of the tasks that we do are repeatable 
you have to figure out how to make that robot repeat it, which that's where the companies come. That's where Roos comes in. That's where all the other RPAs come in. That's what, you know, that's what SOARs do. It's super important. And it's instead of, instead of you building the automation, they're doing it and providing it to you and giving you the option to change the, the, the variables that are needed to change. Like, you know, what, what MFA do I need to check? Uh, where I need to alert? Do I need to alert teams, Slack, you know, stuff like that. Um, it's, it's been a, a mantra since like the early lab tech days, the early, you know, Kaseya is like, Hey, automate it. Can you do it more than once? Automate it. What do you mean? You, can you, you, you log in, create an account. You can do that with PowerShell. You can do that with the application. Automate it. It's, just, <laughs> and they're just taking that approach and making it much more easy and much more consumable by the MSP. RPAs are the future. They're going to allow you to do things that your uh, your DevOps person can do, that your uh, RMM could do, but you're also going to be spending 40 hours, 80 hours, 160 hours to build that solution. And then you're going to have to customize that constantly for every single thing because not all of your clients are going to be on Azure. Not all of your clients are going to be on local on-prem AD. You might have someone who uses Google. You have to customize for that. Like it's companies that do RPA, specialize in RPA, have already built this out. And they just like, here, give me some money and then you can have it. <laughs> yep. yep. Yeah. And, and you're right. Uh, and and I, I love seeing the, the comments chat. These, you guys get it. You, you really understand it. Like, uh, um, for example, uh, I think it was Zaf. Yeah. Zaf said that, you know, SOAR is basically an RPA with a security focus. That's exactly right. Um, in fact, the whole term RPA is while it's a pretty well understood of what RPA is, it's so vast in what it can do. My brother actually worked for an RPA company um, uh, that does like insurance stuff. And so it does like OCR on like insurance documentation and then delivers that data in intelligent ways into like insurance platforms. And it's an RPA. It's vastly different than like what Roost is building but it's still based around automation. It's just how, what is the tool set that you're trying to do and what are the use cases you're trying to solve? And the other thing I think that the folks in this, in, I almost said Slack, in the chat are really understanding is what does automation success look like? Well, I think it looks like two things. One, it, does, it looks like it doesn't have to be 100%. If I automate even some, I'm winning. So like, don't think about the perfect enemy of good. You know, it, it doesn't have to be perfect. And then the second thing I think is there's always going to be a problem to solve. And I love that they said that, right? So like autom what it should really do is how do we get rid of the rote tasks that are out there? That's what gives my ability for me to scale. And, you know, if I'm a business owner and I'm hearing the use case of an RPA like, like Roost, I'm thinking, okay, I know why I want this because I want to give my analysts the ability to scale so they can work on the things they like, but they don't have to, you know, stick, click, click, click the same things ever. That becomes the skull drudgery that makes you want to rip their hair out and, and quit. And it gives me the ability to protect my margins and grow much quicker. So that if I ever want to sell my MSP one day, I'm going to have a suitor that's going to come and be like, man, you guys are a profitable MSP. You're definitely worth higher margins. So like, this is the future. I totally agree with you. Um, however you look, this, this is where the, the future is going. And we sort of forced ourselves into this because as we got deeper into detection, all of a sudden response and recovery, and this is in security, but IT as well, we forced ourselves into having to do more automation because we can't affordably stay doing what we're doing in security, let alone IT in this modern age. Yeah, people cost money. People are expensive. I would know. So I call it meatware, hardware, yeah. software, and meatware. Yep. And I mean, just let I me mean, think about it. Like the, the use case that we've talked about, um, that I've talked about before, uh, user account, employee onboarding as an MSP. Think about every single app you have to create an account for. Uh, your documentation platform, your uh, RMM, your PSA, your Active Directory, uh, you, your SOXM, your security systems, your, you have to give them authorization to a bunch of other different things. Um, and you can automate that. You can run a PowerShell snippet. And if your systems have APIs that allow you to do account creation and stuff like that, you can set that up and automate it. Um, but that's what, that's what companies are doing with RPA. I, I mean, we've, again, going back, 
when I first was dealing with RMMs, I have a dev background. I can easily understand what I'm like. It's, it's a, it's a decision tree. You know, we talked about AI decision trees. Um, and you can look at this account doesn't have MFA. This one does. We'll open a ticket. We'll enable MFA. We'll set up the user. We'll send them a text message. Hey, you're getting in. Like there's, it's just stuff that's done because one person needed it and now the world needs it. And we're just going to include it in our platform. And SSO isn't as single as it appears to be. <laughs> um, that I've lost. It's the he worst. Print T-shirt that says that. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing it. I'm still in it. Uh, collect TM. Uh, it's because yeah, it, it, and you log onto your desktop. You SSO into that. Cool. You log into your uh, your RMM platform. You still have to log in with the same credentials, but you still have to log in. You log into your PSA. You still have to log into that. You have to MFA into all of it. Like that stuff's not, it's just not there. And RPA systems will allow you to press a button, type in some information, go. And all of that does is created on the back end. That's, that's my dream. As, yeah. as, as someone who did automate dev, <laughs> that stuff is my dream. Automating user account creations. Password rotations. Oh man, this stuff's fun. Yep. But and now then you get to move on to more fun things in life. Yeah. 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 It makes it accessible though. Yep. Um, and I think that's key because DevOps people are expensive. People can understand how systems work in a, in a, a developer format. You understand if Wes works today, make sure his security is on. Right. That's, that's, you can understand that. If it's not, take these actions. That's, it's simple. It's if, the, if this, then that, right? You know, someone mentioned IFTTT in chat, but it's, it's just a simple check this, do these actions. But writing that in code, not everyone can understand and process that. So RPAs are simplifying that into low code, no code to make it easier for people to digest. And I think that's going to make things. And for those who don't understand the power of this type of automation, I think it's going to open their eyes more so than spending 150 grand on a DevOps guy who's going to make your world easier. Agree. Agree. How secure is our RPAs? That's a good question. Um, you know, let's talk about that for a minute. There's two ways to look at that. Um, obviously, it's what can the RPA do, and and you have to threat model this, right? What all could what is what is it potentially capable of doing? Where does it have access? Can, for example, can an RPA does it have access to the endpoint? Can it run its own commands? Can it stage commands and then run those commands? If so, it's a very very significantly dangerous tool that's right for a buffalo jump attack, just like an RMM. Um, but the other angle you have to look at too is what level do my RPA, um, do my APIs give me to prevent certain things from happening? We talked about this in the cyber call, feels like a year ago now, but it probably wasn't that long back. Um, and we were talking about how often do we even look at like the API permissions that we give out when we create um, tokens and keys and how many APIs don't even give us granular ability to control, okay, this particular key I'm going to use for this system, it stinks that like, I, it's just an all or nothing, right? But if it isn't all or nothing, and I actually have granular controls and what this API has permission to do, you better go through it and really check for it and then go yell at your vendors that don't have those capabilities for API security. I'm like, this is what we need. So it's a two-way street on all of this. And we need both of them to work together hand in hand for us to, to, to be a little bit more comfortable on when it comes to security here. Yeah, so you're, you're removing the threat vector of a user fat fingering leaving his account open the entire plethora of those potential errors um but you're 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 adding in the vector of if the rpa you're utilizing is breached what's the, you know is it siloed is my account siloed from everyone else so if someone gets breached and it's not me am i affected um is uh the rpa you know can it just run stuff? Does it have access immediately to the entire database of, you know, how does that work? Is it individualized components? 
Um, or does it store all the stuff in a nice little table that I can just pull and then boom, my data's gone. <laughs> uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of questions you can ask the RPA, but it's like any vendor. It's just like any, any, uh, RMM or any system that any EDR or XDR or SIM or SOC or whatever endpoint agent you put on your machine. If you give someone permission and access, that's a threat factor and you have to evaluate that at, at what you feel comfortable with. Yeah. You know, there's always going to be a trade-off between automation and security. Always. Yep. And, and these things need to be clearly articulated all decision mm -hmm. makers. Yep. Wes, how do you do vendor management? You're, you've been on the vendor side. You are a vendor for yeah. all intents and purposes in this conversation. Yeah. How would you expect me as an MSP to do vendor management? Uh, times are changing with this for sure, right? You are both caught up as an MSP. You're both caught up as a vendor and you're caught up with your vendors. And we're seeing this come to bear like crazy. Uh, I'll give you examples of this, right? When the latest RMM mass attack du jour, it's happened multiple times over the past few years, all your clients ask you, you know, what happened? Are we affected? Um, are you using XYZ software? Uh, you even see like insurance agencies. Remember when State Farm, no, is Allstate maybe that sort of like blackballed data for no real Allstate. reason? It was really weird. Like you see these kinds of things happen. And so as vendors, like you get stuck in the middle of all of this. And um, also the vendors that we select and choose ourselves, how well do we know them? And how well do we know their fourth parties? And there's a little bit of vendor management that I've gotten jaded from. And I feel like it's a lot of compliance box checking that doesn't really move the needle because I'm never going to get full knowledge of everything that's going to happen, right? If it can happen to Okta, it can happen to Microsoft, it can happen to me. And there's no amount of like checking where I'm going to find this one thing that led to that breach. However, I do think vendor management has a role and a purpose to help us identify and push the needle forward for everybody. Because here's the reality. If we're all asking our vendors the same sets of questions, the vendor can't say, well, no one's ever asked us that before. Let's go and evaluate. Maybe in a year we can do this. No, if every single MSP is asking us X, Y, Z, they're going to start to listen. They're going to start to do things. Jason Slagle talks about this all the time of like, that's how we move the needle is it takes a village. So let's build that village. And so vendor management and third-party risk management is supposed to be this practice of how is my relationship going with my vendor based on certain criteria of things that I want to see in them? I want evidence of security maturity. I want, I want details and data inside of all of this. And we've, we've gone down this road of like the early days, it was literally just who do I like into it became, do you remember the days of, do you have a SOC too? Oh, yeah. And it was like, oh, you got a SOC too. I'm not even going to read that thing. You just have it. So it's the gold standard. Uh, I have seen, and this is a tangent we don't have time for, but I've seen SOC 2s that are embarrassing. Um, I saw, I had a vendor give me a SOC 2 once at my bank. Um, it was for, an, it was, I, they were doing email encryption for me. The SOC 2 didn't even have that under coverage. It was like for their firewall platform. I'm like, hey, yo, no test, no controls were tested for email security. And they're like, no one's ever asked us that before. You know, the why not? Thing. You're an email security vendor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. And I'm like, it says it right here that it's not even in scope. And they're like, yeah, no one's ever mentioned that, but we're aware. And at some point we'd like to have this under scope. So I'm like, so you have no like controls that are tested that you can show me for this platform? They're like, no. And no one ever asked. They just asked for the SOC 2 and move on. I'm like, wow, wow. Right. And that doesn't mean that their security is good or bad. It just, it's very telling. Um, so, so now we've moved beyond this. Do I have a SOC too? Do we actually read them, you know, and we look for like exceptions that are in them. We look to make sure the TSPs that are tested, you know, like privacy, security, availability, the other, there's five total are all in there. We look at the scopes of services provided. We get some information out of it, but a SOC two doesn't mean anything. Like people say SOC two certified. That's not even a thing. Like it's not a certification. It's an attestation. And if you read the fine print from the CPA, the CPA is like to the best, they basically say this and in, in CPA language is that we tested these controls and if they're operating effectively, then they would do what they say they're supposed to do. That's like literally all a SOC 2 does, you know, not, it's not bad. It's just not everything. So now we're going to approach this next era, which is 
I'm glad you have a SOC 2. We are going to review it, but we're going to actually ask methodical questions and get a better understanding of exactly what you're doing. The problem is we have the same problem the enterprise has, which is still all a bunch of yes, no's, and there's no way for us to authenticate. There's just not. We can't measure it, just like cybersecurity. So this is where vendor management is at, and you're going to see vendor management platforms come into the channel. Um, I'll make a weaker prediction. If I promised you, you're going to see multiple cyber insurance and related companies that's secure, then I'll make you a minor promise of maybe we'll see a couple vendor management companies in at IT Nation Secure. And I'm just using secure because it's one of the bigger flagstone security focused channel events. And so like, if you want examples of these, um, uh, there's one called Prevalent. Prevalent is really well known in the enterprise, but you read their website and be like, what the heck are these people talking about? Uh, there's one in the banking space called Venminder, V-E-N, Minder, like Vendor Minder. Um, they're awesome. They're smaller. They're more, much more to banking only, but they're an example of one. There's a lot of these that are out there that they're, think of them as basically like vendor focused CMSs, right? So I can, I can send out, you know, content management systems, like almost like WordPress. I can send out um, questionnaires. I can get data back on them. I can write things about what I see on them. I can give myself tasks to follow up on them. Um, I can um, do risk assessments on those vendors and output that data and show trend levels of like how they're changing and getting better or worse. Um, that's kind of what vendor management platforms are. And so I think we're going to start to see some of that kind of creep into the channel as well, because it's going to become forced on us because our larger clients, like a bank is going to say, Hey, MSP, you're a part you're a huge part of my supply chain. Are you checking your vendors? And you're going to be like, no, but I don't want to lose you as a client. So I guess I'll better start doing this. That's what's going to happen. Interesting. Um, because you're right. Like we can ask all the questions we want and they can give us whatever answers they feel like giving us, if any at all. Yeah. Um, and there's no way for us to verify if they're right or not. We, they're not going to give us access to their systems. They're not going to let us audit them. Um, so having a centralized platform that might have the ability to go in and, and do audits to our questions and, and to put, um, you know, some, you know, the thumb down and say, Hey, look, this is something you need to do. We need to do this and check it and provide data back to see who's doing what, where, and why, and be able to measure the data to, so that not only the perspective people who are asking, but your current client base can sign in and be like, Oh, that's nice. That's good. You know, I'm happy with what you're doing as, as my vendor, because you have a lot of hearsay and a lot of, well, my experience was X, right. And that just doesn't translate. That's just, I mean, anyone can say that if they have one person who had a bad experience with it, they hate that vendor for the rest of their lives. Right. Um, or I have an inside contact who said they have SOC 17 and they're great and they, they have all these methods and processes and procedures and they test them every day. And, and you're like, oh, wow, that's cool. And then it turns out they don't have anything. Uh, their processes were something they stole off of Google and that they don't even match the business. They can't even run them. Um, and that's, you, you can't verify that stuff, right? That's, it, there's no centralized system to be able to make the the informed decisions a more mature msp needs to make to be able to stay ahead of the game and i'm i'm excited to be able to have vendor management platforms that sounds fantastic and it saves a lot of work for me because there's no doubt they're going to have default questionnaires that would be like oh that's a good question to ask i didn't think of that yep. um and it's 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 fantastic i i hope that that happens yeah I, you know, I, I think it will. Um, I really think it will. I think we're going to be forced into it and um, I th it'll be met with varying degrees of success. You know, it's one of those, like if I had to pick something that's a better, like a real game changer for new stuff, like what we talked about so far, XDR, it's more of just more, more, more MDR. So not really that. Um, SOAR for sure, but use case specific. So RPA, Definitely, I think is more impactful. And so if I had to rank them, it'd be RPA, um, SOAR, XDR, vendor management. That's kind of how I'd rank them in terms. No, nah, I might even flip the vendor management and XDR just because XDR is a marketing term. But yeah, I don't, I, I think it's going to be good. I think we're going to have to get into it, but I don't think it's going to return great results and move the needle forward in a drastic way either. Interesting. Because I think it, it has the potential to it, definitely. Um, whether, I mean, because you have to have vendor buy-in. 
that's the that's the only way you'll get any any progress with this as a vendor. I'll have Fair. to be like, you know what? I understand. Yep. I appreciate what you're trying to do. Um, let's both be better, right? That's that's the, that's you have to have someone in the leadership team of that vendor be able to make that determination. Um, the board, the CEO, whoever is running it, because if they're not on board, it doesn't matter what you try to do. They're not to just send you back information, and they'll just be an NA on everything, right? Yep, that's fair. So, um, I mean, I think that's all the topics we have today. Um, Man, that was fun. It was fun. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I mean, it's eight o'clock. I don't know how much time you have left, Wes. Um, I have a few minutes left. We can do some quick Q and A's. Uh, Regulations may push vendor buy-in. That may be an easier yeah. way for that to be adopted by vendors. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That's where regulations could definitely come into play. Uh, favorite bourbon? Great question. Ooh. Actually, I didn't ever pour any of this, but I did bring some New Riff. I really like the New Riff rye. Let me get it in front of my face and I'll refocus. There we go. New Riff rye. Yeah, that's a really, really if you like rise, which I do, uh, this is a really good one. It used to be only in Kentucky is the only way you can get it, but now I've I've even found them in Florida. Um, it's a really, really good one. It's, it's a higher proof. It's a hundred proof, um, but it's high-ish. It's not super high, um, but it's actually pretty smooth. Um, it's really good. I like it. Um, Interesting. How would you compare yeah. it to Woodford Reserve? Uh, I think Woodford is a little sweeter. And actually, I think Woodford's even a little smoother than New Riff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if I, hmm, I've never blind. So I don't have the world's most amazing palate. I'll readily admit that I'd need to blind taste both of them. But the last time I had Woodford rye, I loved it. I thought it was so good. Um, I'd, I'd be a fun one to test together, but yeah, favorites of mine would be, um, uh, well, uh, I really like peerless and peerless rye. Uh, both of those are really, really good. I've been nursing those for a little while. Um, obviously everyone loves Blanton's and I love Blanton's for sure. I know it's cliche to say, but it's good. So those are a few. What's the meaning of life? Uh, 42. Is that right? I believe that's correct. Good job. Uh, didn't pour any of this. Half the bottle's gone. <laughs> he didn't pour any of it tonight. Yeah. 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 Uh, this is a good, this is a good, I, I want to do this. Wes, what is next for you? Um, next stay big thing. Stay tuned. And it's, I'm not saying stay tuned because I don't want to say, I actually don't fully know yet. Um, I'm taking some time off, um, although I'm staying stupid busy. Um, so I'm still doing all the normal things I do, like cyber call and things like that. Um, I have taken some advisory positions. So I'm advising um, Roost. I'm advising Finn Security. We haven't even talked about Finn, but you guys need to go check them out. P-H-I-N, Finn Security. Um, they're freaking awesome. Yeah, FinSec, yep. Um, they're doing some great, great things in the security awareness um, space that I think is going to be disruptive. Um, and then uh, I've got some insurance stuff I'm working on too, which I'm really excited about. So that's a lot of what I'm doing on like an advisory side. And I'm record I'm actually in the middle of recording recording a ton of content. So like I have, uh, let me, let me show this. I can't show you, but I can tell you um, I've got a bunch of content I'm working on. If I can find it here. And you could share your screen. I'm sure it will. I mean, we have to fiddle with some stuff, but it would translate. That's okay. No, no, it's all good. Um, yeah, go subscribe I, to Wes's YouTube channel. Here we go. So I've, I've recorded content and you guys are the first to know this, um, like top, top 10 reasons why your cybersecurity sales fail. Um, how breaches happen where I'm giving like a, like a client focused, here's how the breach happens, Mr. Client, Miss Client. You actually play for the client and then use that to, to talk, like how ransomware happens in a, in a user-friendly way. I recorded a bunch of those things. Um, I Cybersecurity and insurance, some of the things we talked about today, where that play is going in, how MSPs need to play into this. Um, I'm diving into like CIS for CSF. So it's been spending a lot of my time in recording a ton of content. I actually don't at this point know where it's going to be like released. Um, I'm still waiting on that, um, but I'm doing, a, I'm really having fun kind of creating a bunch of like little mini courses. Um, just for the record, the brain, so MSP Geek would love to host any content you would like to put on yeah. MSP Geek's channel. So you just, you'd say the word and okay. we'll make it happen. Maybe we can, maybe we can do something like that. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and then as far as like big time, full-time things I'm doing next, um, we'll just have to see. I'm not, that's why I was saying, I'm not sure yet. I don't know myself yet. Um, but, uh, I'll figure it out eventually once I grow up. Wes Spencer currently unemployed. <laughs> that's, that's what you should have said for my title. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, it's, you're living the dream right now. I mean, it's great. But, well, I know this Kyle, I know I love MSPs and I love the channel and I don't want to go anywhere. Um, I believe that MSPs are the only way 
that security is delivered for the SMBs that have no hope outside of MSBs. And so for me to have an opportunity to, to impact that and come alongside you guys means the world. So I don't want to go anywhere. I'll tell you that. Yeah. I mean, you just think about it. So if you look at SMBs and you look at what we replace, you have tier one, tier two, and tier three engineers, you have project engineer, you have a security engineer, all that is rolled up into the MSP price. No SMB is going to be able to afford someone who knows all of that in a single person. So, I mean, it makes, it's, it's, you're right. I mean, then you might get lucky and they might have a couple of smart guys who happen to fiddle around in tech that might be able to, to do some things, but not to the level that an MSP should be able to. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And I believe there's no questions. So the best part about this, I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm going to end the stream. So thank you, Wes, for joining cool. us. It must Hi, be thanks for having me. Anytime. Super Anytime. blast. It was super fun and went really long, including that. They, it, and we're going to ignore the web, the, the internet issues. Um, I'm going to keep those in the edit just so everyone knows. Everyone can see the pain of me trying to fill the dead air. <laughs> so, I am sorry about that. It's not your fault. Yeah. It's just funny. And anything that makes fun of me is fantastic. <laughs> so uh, everyone, have a good evening. Uh, hope everyone's weekend rest of the week goes well uh, and we'll see you next month thanks <laughs>